yes, this farm grows organic food and tries to be environmentally sustainable, but that's only one aspect of the greater picture of what it takes to change. Okay. Ultimately, the course of humanity, I feel like that's a big statement, but it really takes the change internally um, in order for the external change to be successful. Light morning struck me as a very special place where that change is happening. Although few people live here, they reach out to the world in meaningful ways. Sometimes we have people staying here, oftentimes for meditative retreats. So there are two guest rooms here. Katie's in this one and Jen's in that one. We won't go into their rooms, but, uh, but this room is open. This is a room I call Raideral. And can, uh, there are a lot of people that have come here in, in real sort of crisis or transitional points in their life, and especially if they're working in meditation practice or something, stuff comes up. And so to have a room like this for people is, is, is a gesture of caring. And uh, oftentimes people find that in somewhat short supply in their lives. We have set up uh, down in the valley uh, a meditation retreat cabin called Parsival that we can go to that's removed from here and yet easily accessible so that people can bring meals down, we can uh, help serve each other. Some cold tomatoes and persimmons and main course. And that's going down to Parsival where Chris is doing a three day sit. It's hard to find places where you can, uh, where you can renew your practice for several days and, and deepen it and, in, a, in an enchanting natural environment like it's down there in, in, in the valley uh, and have a community of fellow meditators um, helping to support you in your practice. Coming here and um, just, you know, simply taking part in gardening and cooking for other people and like canning food and having like a sustained sort of emotional rapport, a kind of deeper way of communicating and plus continuing my meditation practice just being in a place where all of these things are valued has given me a more um, stable sense of self. Wow, that's meditative. <laughs> Don't interact with people holding cameras very often. What's your name? <laughs> it's kind of like I'm learning a way to, to be who I truly am or something like that, or, or a way to be myself. I was moved by Light Morning's atmosphere of support and love. I wanted to know more about how such a place began. Over 35 years ago, the four founding members of Light Morning, Marlene and Ron Hassel and Robert and Joyce Foote, bought the land where Light Morning is today with the intention of creating a new way of life, emphasizing living off the land, shared meals, and meditation, among other things. Over the years, other inspired people joined the community, and together they developed the garden, maintained their homesteading way of life, built structures using their own labor, and continued with Light Morning's key values. Morning was built in order to continue for generations. But over the years, people have come and gone, leaving Light Morning at a low population point during my internship, with just the four founding members and Richard.
And so that brings up all kinds of questions as to why the four founders came and stayed and why other people have come and gone. Mm. And they might have come and gone for several days or several weeks or several months or several years or sometimes eight, 10, 12 years, mm. but all you know, moved on for one reason or another. Mm. And so that's one of the things that we're really looking at getting, or I'm really looking at getting back into a sense of uh, numbers and sustainability and how far along we are in uh, whether we're in third grade or fourth grade or whatever it happens to be towards some sense of uh, resolution or realization of the vision that drew us here i try to just adopt a don't know attitude uh, i know what i want but i know that reaching too hard or trying to cling or try to uh, be too insistent about exactly what it is or how it's going to come or when it's going to come is counterproductive. Fulfillment is not in my hands. It's in, it's in some other much more capable hands. I had come to a community that was at a crossroads. Perhaps more people would come and continue their mission. I considered the possibility I also sort of fell in love with this really great guy. So let me walk into a tree, all right? <laughs> so I continued my tour onto the next community, thinking that I might someday come back here to live. kind enough to drive me to Twin Oaks Community in Virginia. I came here for a three-week visitor period, along with eight other people. Oh, Toothbrushing! It's a very intimate moment in the life of Twin Oaks. Mm -hmm. Toothbrushing together! Oh, that's so sweet! <laughs> Twin Oaks started in 1967, and over the years has grown into a functioning small village. It has its own community businesses, full farm with vegetables, chickens, and cows, 300 acres of shared land to roam, and at the time of my visit, about 100 people lived there. It is literally one of the most well-known of all the intentional communities in the United States. Twin Oaks is in a way a social experiment. It's an alternative way of living. You might know this phrase, another world is possible. We say another world is happening and we're living it. Twin Oaks is what we call an intentional egalitarian community. Intentional means that we're trying to create our own culture. And uh, egalitarian means we try to uh, treat each other as equals. Okay, so what is egalitarian? I mean, don't most of us try to treat each other equally anyway? Egalitarianism takes that a step further. At Twin Oaks, there is a complex governing structure arranged so that all members make decisions together. Managers and planners, with the feedback of everybody, determine all community decisions, from when and how to maintain the buildings to what tools and food they're going to buy. It's basically the idea that every member who lives here has an equal voice in making our decisions, and we make our decisions um, as a group. People can give their input either through um, the written word, we can write comments on certain proposals. For people who prefer to talk in front of a group, we have community meetings, people can come and give their input that way. So we try to have a different range of um, options for people to give their input so everyone's able to lend their voice to whatever decision we end up making about a given issue. Egalitarian also means that the entire community is income sharing. That means all the money that is made in the community businesses is spent on housing, tools, food, and other basic necessities for everyone. It also means that all labor is valued equally, whether it's doing laundry or making tofu for the business. 
We have several collectively owned businesses. We have a hammocks business, a tofu business, a book indexing business, and other smaller businesses as well. Because we're income sharing, that means that not every single person has to be doing work to support them single selves to get along in the world. What that means is we can put some people to work in the garden, they're growing food for us while other people, for example, can do outreach. Normally, the people who would be doing outreach would have to be, you know, getting everything they need in life first and then doing this extra work. And so because we share the labor in this way and just divide up all the jobs, different groups in the community are able to give energy to things that we might not be able to as individuals. One hour of labor is equivalent to another hour, whether I'm doing bookkeeping or working in the tofu shop or cooking dinner, a lot of the kind of everyday chores are actually creditable in terms of the labor system. So the things we do to take care of each other are just as valued as the things we do to make money in this community. together and I would have these done you know have like a set of them done first and then drop them in at the same time so they cook at the same time. Yeah. Um, How long do they have to cook for? So uh, it's usually when it's ready your development goes on so completely away. Okay. Every member works 42 hours a week, and so in exchange for the 42 hours of work that the member gives the community, I like to say the community gives the member our lives. We get food, we get housing, we get health care, and for things that the community doesn't provide, we also get $75 a month for extras like chocolate or junk food or something like that. It's really organized and like a really big, a really professional um, place. and. Uh, that pretty much blew me away. There's no bosses, you know, no landlords and no bosses, so I'm an owner of one one hundredth of this location and I can give input into any of the businesses where I feel like I have something to say and it will be weighted with other people's input as well. And part of not having a boss means I get to be my own boss and that I get to, at Twin Oaks, choose a lot of my own work and set my own schedule. I have a lot more flexibility uh, living at Twin Oaks than I, than I would if I had a mainstream job. I don't do the same thing uh, 40 hours a week, and I don't have to work 9 to 5. In fact, only once a week do I have to put two hours into cleaning up the dishes. Beyond that, the other six days a week, uh, I can just get to walk away from it. a lot of our own food. That's a pretty significant benefit. I mean, here I have vegetables that were grown here on the land, you know, pretty much organically. Um, that would be pretty expensive out there to find it. And even then it wouldn't be grown on the land I live on, which is, you know, people talk about buying local. It doesn't get any more local than, you know, the land I live on. But we raise our own cows, so I get uh, milk and dairy products that don't have you know, growth hormones in them or antibiotics in them. 